Thank you so much for joining CIY. Absolute pleasure. I don't know if I can <laughs> shake your hand off <laughs> the, <laughs> <off> the <laughs> climbing. <laughs> but um, you are a trend specialist. Mm. Now, does that mean that you help companies um, look into the future and uh, address the trend and technology that, that's coming up? I, I, I try to, I, I think the best way I can describe what I do is categorize and contextualize trends to give businesses the opportunity to innovate with purpose and laser focus. You see, there's so many trends and they're differently applied in different parts of the world to different types of consumers in different types of industries. Yeah. So if you don't categorize and contextualize it, you don't give the courage to the business owners to make the new decisions. Yeah. So I actually call it Trenovate, which is categorizing trends to help you innovate. Okay. Mm. And I read your book, What's Your Moonshot? Thank you. And I really enjoyed it. Thank you. What, what inspired you to write the book? A couple things. Um, in fact, three things. Um, the first thing was, there's a great saying by Yogi Bhajan. He's the guy who brought Kundalini Yoga from the East to the West. And he okay. says that if you want to learn something, read about it. If you want to understand something, write about it. And if you want to master something, teach it. Okay. And so, mm, by no means am I a master, but having to put a book together really forces you to become very keenly focused in on what are you trying to teach? Yeah. And so I really had to become quite sharp about that. The second reason was there's a Feng Shui principle that says go out with the old to bring in anything new. And I had this sort of thinking and ideas and concepts and frameworks in my head for 40 years. Yeah, yeah. And so really to release them was giving me the allowance to bring on something new. And lastly, I truly believe that individuals today have the same power as organizations and companies have had in the past. Mm -hmm. And we're able now to create bigger, broader, big moonshots. And just from our own individual capacity with the access to billions of people on the net. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. and, and you mentioned competition and you say that, that, that your competitors of the future are not going to be your competitors of today. Absolutely. because you have no idea who your competition is going to be and you have no idea from where it's going to come. I'll give you an example. Mm. The spice trade that lasted hundreds of years was disrupted by the ice trade. A gentleman in Boston, America, for the first time ever, was able to create a warehouse that was able to transport ice between places on ships. Yeah. He was then able to take ice from one part of the world to India and then break the whole uh, spice trade that was over land for many years with so many people having people touch it, making it very expensive. All of a sudden, because you could take ice to India, nobody in India had ice. So all of a sudden, ice was worth so much. They gave him so many spices. He was able to bring and totally break the price barons with their spices. But then you see what happened? The electricity started making ice machines. And ice machines now were cheaper than carrying <laughs> ice from around the world. Wow. Now on top of that, ice machines made ice boxes which became fridges. Do you know that last year, the sharpest in decline of fridge sales in New York and San Francisco ever. Why? Because Amazon Fresh now delivers anything in 60 minutes. You don't need to have a fridge at home anymore. This is disruption. That is Spice disruption. to ice, to electricity, to drones. So now if you are not able to understand where disruption is coming from, if your eye is not about agility and it's about competition, competition mm -hmm. because spice people are competing against spice people. Yeah, yeah. Ice warehouse is competing against ice. Ice machines are competing against ice machines. Fridges against fridges. No, no, no. That's not where the competition is coming yeah. anymore. Now you said that um, by 2020, almost 50% in the US, almost 50% of, of people are going to be um, self-employed or freelancers, as yes. you termed it. Yes. That's an incredible amount. That yes. Means, does that mean that the whole shift is moving towards entrepreneurship? Yes. So I think in the past, and it's not my stat, it's a McKinsey stat actually, okay. I've just quoted them. Um, in the past, large organizations were able to bring efficiencies. And what has happened today is that efficiency is the cancer for innovation. Mm -hmm. And what we need today is agility. And big, massive organizations aren't able to be agile. And this lack of agility puts them at a very back foot. And that's why big organizations, and I think the trend, not I think, I know the trend is called the decentralization of power. Okay. And so what we're seeing is these mega structure organizations really starting to fold away to create small networked businesses. Yeah. So entrepreneurship and this idea that we have access to so much information, to so much 
ability to manufacture anything we want through 3D printing and the yeah. likes puts us in a very powerful position to create small mini businesses around us that could possibly become global businesses with the advent of Kickstarter or any of those yeah. sort of tools. Yeah. So I think this move towards entrepreneurship is driven by two things. One, the lack of security inside these corporations and two, access to so much. Yeah. It makes it a no-brainer exactly. to actually start becoming a freelancer. Maybe three tech. Yeah, well, exactly, but this access is tech. Is tech yeah. it, it actually, tech is the, f the interface. Yeah. Um, and, and, I, and, I, and I say, we, McKinsey says 2020 in America, yeah. but if we look at how communication is growing around the world, yeah. I believe that the rest of the world will be on the same trend in the next yeah. five to 10 years without even trying. It becomes a natural sort of organic process. Yeah. You've recently been uh, inducted as a faculty member of a, in a Singularity University. What is that? What is a Singularity University? Singularity University was started by two gentlemen about eight to ten years ago. Um, Ray Kurzweil, who's a bona fide genius, um, he's written a book called The Singularity is Near. 86% uh, of his predictions have come true so far. Um, his prediction is that by 2029 computers will be as smart as human beings. Yeah, yeah. And the other gentleman is Peter Diamandes, who's a very well-known futurist, a space um, entrepreneur, a author, um, just an all-round futurist. Um, the two of them got together and set up a, a university in the same campus as NASA in San Francisco. Wow. And their main job is to help the world understand the future better and to solve the grand challenges that face humanity. Hunger, yeah. thirst, education, energy and these sort of things. Mm -hmm. As being a faculty member, I started to get to teach around the world and start to work with the largest organizations and governments around the world, helping them prepare for the future. Yeah. Wow. Finally, where do we start by reaching for our moonshot? We, we've got to become clear that we first have the capability to reach our moonshots today. And we have the capability as individuals to reach billions of people. That's never been an option for us as human beings. Yeah. And for us to have this new capability means that if we're able to bring a solution that can just create a positive notion in two million people yeah. that could pay you one dollar each for that, look at that idea and how quickly it can spread. So first and foremost, what's our, in, what's our internal dialogue saying to us? How confident are we feeling about ourselves, the impact we bring, how much of an architect are we? And then secondly, how much are we exposing ourselves to the future to understand it? I often get off keynotes and people go, oh my God, it's like, I'm so scared, I'm so worried. I'm like, the only reason you're doing that is because you haven't been exposing yourself. Yeah. How often do you get onto trend websites? How often do you watch futurists talking? How comfortable do you, are you with the language that's being used? Because the more you expose yourself to it, it's like a virtuous cycle, right? The more I expose myself to it, the more of an architect I become. The more of an architect I become, the more I expose myself to it. And it's just this continuous loop. But what people do is they, don't expose themselves and stay victims. And so you can't create moonshots. And yeah, then people yeah. think, oh no, you're thinking too big. Calm down, calm down, sit down. But the truth is we've all got access to it now. And if I'm building a business right now called Airborne that yesterday we entered a competition to service Holland's largest telecom business. Now, where, where was that available <laughs> before? Exactly. And I mean, how would I, me in Cape Town, my other partner in London, two partners in Joburg, all of us speak to each other continuously through WhatsApp and Skype and whatever the case may be. We found this competition. We all entered it from around the world. What? Now we could be servicing somebody in Euros in Holland living in Cape Town. This is an opportunity that only you can have when you first believe you can. Yeah. Start developing the, the, the sort of uh, businesses in line with what's coming and then start spreading it to the billions of people that we have access to. That's awesome.